questions? Most righteous and compassionate God, we give you thanks for your love and your mercy which you have bestowed upon us. As we are about to go through this song service, we invite your presence. Help us that as we sing, we will sing to your name's honor and glory, and that we will be filled by your Holy Spirit. Remember Pastor Schillingford, who will be doing the Bible class shortly from now. I pray that you will give him humility, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that as he present your words to your people, they will gather knowledge and that they will help others to know you so that they too can be in that number when the saints go marching in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, at this time, we're going to sing number 610, Stand Like the Brave, number 610. Christ and awake, tis the master's command, with helmet and shield, and a sword in his hand, to meet the bold tempter, go violently go, then stand like the brave, with a face to the foe, stand like the brave. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to the foam. The cause of the master with vigor defend, be watchful, be zealous, and fight to the end. Wherever he leads thee, go violently go. Then stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to Press on ever doubt in the captain is near with grace to supply and with comfort to cheer. We live like the stream in the desert will flow, then stand like the brave with thy face to the foe. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Amen. Number 272. Give me the Bible star of gladness gleaming. Give me the Bible, stars of gladness gleaming to share the wonder, long and tempest stars. No star can hide the peaceful radiance beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precepts and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious world by Jesus spoken. Hold up his lamp to show my Savior's near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light 
In the narrow way, precepts and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten, teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precepts and prophets. Law and love combining Till night shall vanish In eternal day Amen At this time we'll have our pastor Pastor Joel Schillingford Who will be now coming forward To give us the Bible class Thank you We will ask media to put the presentation. Okay, it's there already. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And let us say congratulations to Anthea Young and Shadika Roberts again. We did it this morning, but now we are seeing them in their uniform. And there is another one. Yes, your name is? Devoni. Congratulations. Continue to shine for, for Jesus. Um, this is the last Bible class for the month of March. Uh, next week, we'll be hosting elders, secretariat, and treasurers a pre-affirmation day in the evening. So we won't have any Bible class next week. We are commencing at 4 o'clock with our scheduled elders, secretariat, and treasurers affirmation day. Um, our topic for emphasis today is should a Christian wear jewelry part two. Last week, for those who were not here, we dealt with the topic. We had many questions. Many people had different views on the matter. Some people who thought that it is okay to wear jewelry, and there were others who thought that it is not okay to wear jewelry. We had a fruitful discussion. We agreed to disagree. However, we stood on what we believe as a church from scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And we stopped on a few slides, but let me just review what we dealt with last week. We dealt with a variety of texts that spoke about the issue of jewelry. We laid the foundation and we indicated that jewelry could represent many things in scripture. Sometimes it is used to refer to opulence, wealth, and sometimes it is used in a very derogatory um, way, or not derogatory, but it's used in a negative way. Take, for example, Exodus and Genesis, Genesis 15, Exodus chapter 33, they're about. And we surveyed the gamut of scripture regarding the matter of jewelry and the Bible's position on it and why our church believe what we believe. Now, my friend, Brother Thomas, it is not okay to, be, to simply be a part of this church. It, is, it takes more. You need to know what you believe. Apologia. You need to know what you believe to give an answer to those who ask of you. And... I am going to go to, to we're going to um, slide number eight, just to schedule, to review our slide number eight. Okay, it says, <clears throat> we'll take it from slide number five. It says, 
we are just reaffirming our position on the matter of jewelry. And it says, we are called to be holy or godly, or godly people who think, feel, and act in harmony with biblical principles in all aspects of personal and social life. For the Spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, we involve ourselves only in those things that will produce Christ-like purity, health, and joy in our lives. It continues, continues, next slide. This means that our amusement and entertainment should meet the highest standard of Christian taste and beauty. We don't have it on the screen. Could you put it on the screen? Slide number, I think it's slide number, the next slide, slide number six. Yes. This means that our amusement and entertainment should meet the highest standards of Christian taste and beauty. Now, when Ellen White speaks, she normally makes the differentiation between entertainment and amusement or entertainment and recreation. She points us to wholesome recreation and she talks against this worldly amusement and entertainment. While recognizing cultural differences, our dress is to be simple, modest, and neat, befitting those whose true beauty does not consist of outward adornment, but in the imperishable ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit. Slide seven, as we go to slide seven, she says, it also means that because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, we are to care for them intelligently. Along with adequate exercise and rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from the unclean foods identified in Scripture. Since alcohol, beverages, tobacco, and the irresponsible use of drugs and narcotics are harmful to our bodies, we are to abstain from them as well. Now, this is where it gets a little direct, and this is quoting also from the Seventh-day Adventist manual. Slide number eight. Slide number eight. Slide number eight. To dress plainly, abstaining from display of jewelry and ornaments of every kind, is in keeping with our faith. Testimonies, volume three, page 366. It is clearly taught in the scriptures that the wearing of jewelry is contrary to the will of God. This is from the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual. Uh, it's page 147. The next slide, it says, next slide. Instead, we are to engage in whatever brings our thoughts and bodies into the discipline of Christ, who dress, who desires our wholesome joy and goodness. So right here we see that the church's position is that its members abstain from the wearing of jewelry or ornaments and makes provision only for the wearing of the wedding ring and also the wearing of a functional jewelry we call a watch. And that's what we permit. Now, as we continue, remember this is part two. We would have laid down the foundation. Please go to slide number 20. Slide number 20. In slide number 20, we reviewed last week that when Jacob left Padanaram and he was journeying back to Canaan, we know the story very well. What happened was that the Shechemites raped Dinah. And Dinah's immediate brothers, I think it was Reuben and Simeon, they had a plan for the Shechemites. They said, you have raped our sister. Something has to be done. And they circumcised them. And of course, when you know when men are circumcised, 
they become weak. And on the third day, they massacred them. They killed them all. And Jacob is saying, hey, what is happening? What we are going to do now? We, you have caused trouble for us. And the Lord said, listen, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to bring revival. I'm going to bring reformation. And, and as we go to verse slide number 22, the Lord here spoke and the Lord is saying, listen, let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Verse 4, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was at Shechem. And um, so this is one of the scripture passages we spoke about last week. When God was trying to bring about a revival in the land, he asked them to take away the jewelries. Take it away. Also, in Exodus 23, 33 verse 6, the next slide, we understand what was happening. Moses had gone up. The children of Israel, they went, they gathered the gold and they made a, a golden calf with it. And the Lord says in verse 6, And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Herob. He was going to bring a revival and judgment. And he said, listen to me, you have to get rid of those. They are something between me and you. I don't want you to have them. I don't want you to wear these. I don't want you to have them as my children. In fact, these are idols. And that is what it was really saying in particular. Now, we also, if you go to verse slide 26, we also spoke about the issue of Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 says, um, He shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, for the dead, nor painting any marks upon you. And back in Israel, as we explored last week, the Lord told them, listen to me, don't paint yourself. Don't cut yourself. Don't pierce yourself. Because I am the Lord. And so he warned them against paintings. And, and it is for this reason why we encourage our members not to get tattoos, not to pierce, not to cut, and so on. Because within the scriptures, we have seen where the Lord forbade his children to do this. Now, we are going to move on now. We stopped on slide number 29. And if you go to slide number 29, yes. This was the last thing I showed you last week. And you said that, what did you say? You said this is not good attire. Right? What did you say last week? Come in, yes, come in, come in, take a seat. So last week, last week, you said this is not good attire. And um, come downstairs and ask the question, please. <laughs> and you said this is the painting. This is the painting and... All of you unanimously said this is not good attire. Somebody has a question? And then we move to slide number 30. Okay, Pastor, so um, based on that text a while ago, it says you should not put any cuttings or piercings in your skin for the dead. Me and my friends are conf confused about the for the dead part, so we're wondering, like, what does that mean? Excellent. Very good question. In Levitical times, it was a form of idolatry. It was also a form of divination. And they, Israel got this from the heathen tribes. And they would cut themselves uh, for their dead loved ones as well. 
For example, if they are in mourning. In fact, there's a text last week where we affirmed and we established that jewelry was symbolic mourning and distress sometimes in Scripture. So they would cut themselves for the dead. In other words, you see like how you have nine nights and you have those things for the dead? They did these things as well back then. They would cut themselves as a way of mourning and so on. And the Lord is telling them, don't do that. Don't do that for the dead. And um, what happened is that because the children of Israel spent a lot of time in Egypt, they were sort of oriented within the Egyptian way of life. And the Lord had to wrestle with them for many things, many, many things. Additionally, when we look at um, the story in Kings, where there was a showdown, Elijah, Elisha, and the prophets of Baal, what did they do? They what? They cut themselves. In ancient Mesopotamia, cutting themselves has some significance. And that's within the culture. The Lord is saying, listen to me, I don't want you to do that for the dead. I don't want you to pierce yourselves. I don't want you to mark yourselves. Body marking is not something new and fresh. It is something that has always been around. Piercings, markings in African culture, in Eastern culture, in Mesopotamian culture, people did that. And the Lord is saying, listen to me, I don't want you to do that as the heathen does. You are a peculiar people. I want you to be different. So, hoping that this was answered to you. Now, we know our friend is here who had challenges last, last, and we're happy she's back. She asked a very profound question last week. Now, amulets. One day, I got a call from a family. And this is very important here. And the child, about three or four years old, could not sleep. In fact, that child was so mesmerized that he was acting bizarre, strange, like something was after him. In Jamaica, you all would say, Doppi, I follow him. And they called, and I said, there must be something in that house. Sister Young, must be something in that house. Yes, there was. So the house was rented by a family before, an African family. And what they had, they had several amulets. African spirituality, potions. It was locked up in a room. But that's where they would, the lady would do her chanting and her, you know, her dance and so on. And I said, there must be something here. Pastors came and prayed and nothing. But whenever the family engaged, they are Adventists, the family engaged in worship, that's when the child became most angry, uncontrollable, vex. Little boy. Upon time, you know, this room was entered all of the amulets and potions and so on. There were amulets. And I'm going to show you a picture of one very soon. Amulet. Synonyms amulet. A charm, such as an ornament, often inscribed with magic incarnation or symbol to aid the, we the weave or the wearer or the wearer or protect against evil. Is that familiar with you? In Jamaica, they have guard ring, right? They have guard ring. People wear jewelry to identify with their gods. In ancient times, people wore jewelry to identify with their gods. So, amulets. Now, in today's day, and I'm not sure if you... You all would have known about Kasamba magic, Kasamba psychics. It's always on YouTube. 
You watch, you know, you, you know it. Yes, man. Kasamba. Kasamba psychics. Yes. You watch on YouTube and it just show up. And this lady say, I went to my psychic and I had a difficulty with married men and I was with a married man and, and the psychic told me something. You know, you know. Kasamba psychics, yes. It's all over. It's very popular these days and there are versions of it in Jamaica, in Montego Bay and so on. But what you see now is that people have become so, so much lost and so much wanting hope that people go anywhere for hope. And so this is just to say here, so they would give you an amulet. Next slide, amulet. So in ancient days, this would be a jewelry. But this amulet here would be for a particular purpose. They would pray over it, and it would be like a guard for you. It would be a sense of protection because someone would have had a sort of a divination service over these amulets, and they would have prayed over it. So when it is sold to you or given to you, you believe you are protected. And in ancient days and ancient customs, these were worn as amulets. And as I said, in ancient customs, people wore jewelry to identify with their gods. It was not just for attire. It was not just for as an enhancement to your clothing. People wore jewelry to identify with their gods. So much so, when you, hear, when you see somebody with a cross, right? A chain with a cross. You naturally think, but perhaps they are Christian or so on. Because it sort of identified them with the Christian faith. In early Christianity, they, they wore a fish. The symbol for Christianity was a fish. You know that, right? A fish. You, you all know that. It's a fish. And they would have it as well. But in ancient times... In Levitical times, going up into the Pentecost, they would wear these amulets. If you research a little, and they would have these. Now, these were worn in the neck. These were worn in the leg. These were worn on the body. And so, for example, when <clears throat> in Genesis 32, when in Genesis 32, when... Um, Jacob and his family were leaving Padanaram. And what Rachel did? Rachel took the jewelry, she took the idols and she hid it. And Laban returned for it. In that immediate culture, they have these things for divinations. They wear them and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, the Lord told them, listen to me, I don't want you to wear this. In fact, if I'm going to rot a revival in the land, I would like you to put these things away from you. They are idols. And notice in Genesis, in Exodus 33, Genesis 35, notice the language here. Put these idols away from you. They are cat categorized as idols. Idols. That's how the Bible called them, idols. Because we in perhaps 2024, we wear our jewelry perhaps innocently and we don't have that intention. However, the reason why the Lord is telling them that is because he doesn't want them to associate with the things of the heathen world. And as a result, he guided them. He guided them. Now, <clears throat> sister, you have a question? Could you take the mic? Where's the mic? <clears throat> My thought went back. Um, I don't know. Do you see anything resembles what I'm about to say resembles what you have just said? I have any connection. Has okay. any connection. It's about astrologers. Yes. Like, you know, 
for example, I'm a January born, I'm Capricorn. Mm -hmm. I don't wear a necklace, I don't wear anything, but people wear things that they think that they can go without. Yeah. And uh, they will not leave the house in the morning until they hear yes. what today will bring. What can you say on that? Thanks. Very good question. And although it's not linked to jewelry, the topic, but it's a thought worthy of um, contemplation and worthy of also commenting. The, that is astrology, and we are warned against this. And uh, it is becoming more popular among Christians. So you should not say, Sister Campbell, I march me born, I so we tan. I march, you know. And you go in the horoscope, and you see what match bonds within that time is going to happen to them, you are very much good as a soothsayer. Because you are following the astrological principles and the origins of it is not godly. We are identified as God's people not in the month we were born, but by who we are in Christ. Are you with me? Our personalities differ. Our families of origin differ. Our, our temperaments differ. We are different and we are diverse in, in behavior and so on. But who we are as individuals, it must be grounded in the person of Christ. So we don't, and they say October bonds, them this. Them say October bonds. And I grew up hearing that. And when I heard that about October bonds, I sort of behave like that too. Because you are sentenced. Because March born, they are feisty and they love their own way. And June born, they, 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 uh, they're hardworking. And September, they will trace you for nothing. And, and January born, I saw them tan. And even when we hear, see people behave a particular way, we, we say, I saw a January she born man. That is not of the Lord. We are who we are in Christ. And we don't subject ourselves to cycle, but very good question you have asked. Now, I'm going now to the next slide. The, the, uh, the next slide. Yes. Now, these are sold today as jewelry. These are sold today. In fact, you can purchase one. You can order one. In fact, um, lately there was a, there was a, on YouTube, an uh, ad advert. And this man is saying that the ancient Chinese, they used this jewelry for charm and for good luck and for protection. And he said he is in business and he lost a lot of profits. He lost a lot of customers. But as soon as he got this amulet, things started turning around for him. He's advertising it for people to buy it. And if you are in a desperate situation, a question to the back, if you are in a desperate situation, you are going to fall for it and believe it is the ones giving you the good charm and also, um, how do you call it? Charm and protection. So these are the, in days of old, there's nothing new under the sun. And, and, and for the young people who are here, you may be saying that, well, my friend said it yeah, last week, that jewelry is okay to be worn by the child of God. It's just simply, it's okay. And once we are not decked up and decked up and so on. But the church's principle is founded on scripture. And when we examine these, we recognize jewelry is not to be worn by the child of God. I heard quiet. There is silence here. Yes. Okay. Now, next slide. This one you are familiar with. Are you familiar with this one? Yes. You're familiar with the symbol and so on. These are amulets. If you, if you go anywhere and someone is selling them to you, a good luck charm, or they can just sell it as a piece of jewelry innocently, you wear it. And you start to recognize, but what is happening? So these we stay away from. Now, next slide. 
I'm going to ask, there's a question here. Let us take the question. Question. You, you, you need the mic? Yes. 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 Just amethyst and crystal and, and emerald and yes. Gold, cobalt, nickel, um, uranium, silver, bronze, brass, these are all metals. And they have their purpose. What do we use cobalt for? Phones and batteries. What do we use iron for? What do we use gold for? Gold is a very good conductor of electricity. In fact, it conducts electricity better than most of the other conductors. Um, we trade with gold. We trade with gold. So they have their purpose. In fact, nickel and cobalt, they are getting out. They are over-exhausting them. They are just harvesting them and so on. So all of these have their reasons on the earth. Let us talk about in heaven. In heaven, um, we talk about in New Jerusalem and being clothed and so on. Notice we do not have them on. We are walking on them. They, are, they, are deck, they deck the streets and the walls of the new Jerusalem. Notice we are not decked in them within the corpus of Scripture, but we are walking on them, and they are used to build the foundations of new Jerusalem. Uh, Sister Shadika Roberts, I would like to get the mic to you. I think in a roundabout way, um, our sister was talking about not just the, the metals that we use for like, things like technology and everyday trade. But gold, things. silver, yeah, diamond, yes. But I think she was also more, more pertinent, the things that I see they wear it now. Like the rose cart, the topaz, because I say, okay, that's the birdstone and they wear it and stuff. And they believe that they should charge up the stone in the moonlight. And stuff. Ah, I didn't know that. Yes, and um, this is some for good luck and some for all of these things. Yes, the, the ladies wear them. I do but, not know that. Yes. Thank you so much, Sister Roberts. I did not know that aspect of things. But um, I, think also, I think there's a thin line. If they use them, don't, don't wear, witches wear, wear them on the clothes. But I think some, well, I'm not advocating, but for some, you know, definitely, the way how they make them, you know, it is for that purpose. Uh -huh. yes, and, but we don't indulge in charging up the stone and when it for good luck and health and um, financial pr no. prosperity, yeah. the amulets. Yes, the, we don't believe in that. We know that our blessing comes from God. So that's the rule of thumb. I think... Once we have that, that will guide us. Thank you, Sister Roberts. Now, we moved to, Je uh, we, were, we were in Genesis, we were in Exodus, we were in Isaiah, we were in Peter, we were in First Timothy, and we now move to the last book of the Bible. Now, there is a very unique picture here. Now, John got the book of Revelation from Jesus Christ. In fact, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And John paints a picture of two women. Of course, we know a woman in Bible prophecy represents the church, false church or true church. And we're going to read uh, Revelation chapter 12, and then we're going to read Revelation chapter 17. Where's our Bible reader? Sister Anthea Young, you're going to read Revelation 12 for us? Revelation 12, read from verse 1. Yes. 
So Revelation 12, reading from verses 1, and it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Continue. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Thank you so much. We're going to move over to Revelation 17 now. So this is the pure woman we know in Bible prophecy. And notice how she is described. She has a crown on her head. Of course, this is symbolic of something. And then, but we know going through years of crusades and talking about Bible prophecy, we know God's church is characterized by simplicity. It is characterized by um, a sense of purity. And it's little wonder why Jesus gave John the image of a pure woman to describe his true church. And she's pure, and she's garbed accordingly. Now, when you look to Revelation 17, let, let us read from verse 3. Verse 3? Yes. 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Continue. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Yes, continue. And upon her forehead was, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we see the description of the false church. Why would the Bible of Jesus use a woman decked in gold and costly apparel and purple? And why would, listen to me, it is not John making his story, you know. It is Jesus revealing to John. And of course, as Bible students, we understand that this relates to the two women, the two churches, the pure church and the true church. And notice how they are described. There is a vast difference. One is decked. One is not decked. When we, um, when we compare this with 1 Timothy, 1 um, Peter, we put the pieces together. Our doctrinal position on jewelry is not just based on one text. We surveyed the scripture from Genesis, Exodus, Go down to Isaiah, go down to the Gospels, um, um, go, go down to the Pauline Epistles, Timothy, the Apostle Peter, and now in Revelation, because we have to use the entire scripture to really form a doctrinal position on same. Now, let us look in our modern day. Don't your attire look more simple without jewelry? Talk to me. Talk to me. Sister Roberts is here. Sister Roberts, you look beautiful. If you put the earrings on this one, Lord have mercy. You just change things. Sister Palmer, you look beautiful. And as um, soon as you put the... And when we look at logics, when we look at how we were fearfully and wonderfully made. 
God gave us several holes in our bodies. There is a need to defecate. He gave us a rectum. There is a need to breathe. He gave us nostrils. He, there is a need for hearing. He gave us what? Ears. There is a need for passing waste. Urine. He gave us urethras. Because that's a hole. Um, he gave us, there is a need to eat food. He gave us what? A mouth. There is a need for women in childbirth to deliver the baby. That also was provided. There is a purpose. Now, I'm telling you, God is a master architect. God when he created man, this was his crowning jewel. When he made man, he said, wow, this was a fine specimen. This was something really, listen to me, it was so good. God did not make a mistake when he did not put earrings in our, put holes in our ears. He, did, did he make a mistake? He did not make a mistake. If he wanted us to have something there, he would not make you have to pierce it. He would give you a nice one that is well done. Are you with me? And as you come from your mother's womb, it would be there. Are you with me? Are you with me? And there are many who go to the North American division and because we see it practiced there and we see um, you do what, it, what is in Rome, we believe it is good. And there was a question last week where somebody said in the North American division, the manual um, doesn't speak to our division's manual. But I have one in the office. I went through it. It is the same thing. People at different points in the globe at different times may practice their own thing. But it doesn't mean that it is a position of the church. Are you with me? There is a difference between what some people in a particular jurisdiction may practice and what the church officially teaches in its doctrine of faith. Sister Melville. Um, Pastor, I love Bible class and I'm happy for the information that you're sharing, whether we want to believe it or accept it or whatever. But yeah. I'm just wondering now, wedding bands. Yes. Who should wear or who shouldn't wear it? Right. I, I ask. Yes. Um, I kind of old fashioned. I am married for 35 years. And I'm married I for a, 12 years. And I had a band, uh, my wedding um, ring. Yes. I saw them some time ago. I have never worn them anywhere. But they were dedicated right here. And I, yes. I, right. But I'm just asking now. Those days, I didn't see men wearing bands. What can you say about those? In fact, persons? in 1986, and I should have brought a document here, the North American Division put out a release about wedding bands. And it, you'd be surprised to hear what they said about it. A wedding band is jewelry. Within the context of our church, we see it as functional jewelry. It says something. Now, the manual states that in cases where the custom permits wedding bands, it's right here, we, it's right here, we read it, the church doesn't prohibit the wearing of a wearing band. But if you are asking if it is jewelry, it is jewelry. Now, there is functional jewelry, and it comes on the functional jewelry. Now, early on in early Christianity, now I wanted to do more studies. The Puritans, the Puritans, and I forget there was a one who rebelled against the Catholic Church very early in Christianity. That practice of wearing a wedding band is from about very early 
in Christian's history. Very early. In fact, there was a council held, and I don't like to talk when I don't have the exact quotation, to ban the wedding ring. In fact, there was a council, with, it was the Catholic Church, and they were trying to ban the wedding ring and the reason why they wanted to ban it. However, it is accepted within our ranks. Now, we need to teach the members that you don't have to be married with a wedding band. You don't have to. There are people in Jamaica who believe that once you get married, you must have a ring. This is just tradition, long-standing tradition. But where we are as a church, it says in cultures and customs where the wedding band is permitted, we don't prohibit it. Now, that may seem like double standard to many, and I can understand why you say that. I remember my conference president went overseas, not in Jamaica, in, in another part of the Caribbean. And he said he went, he was, his wife was not there, and was in a hotel, and the lady, some lady started to give him attention. It was attention enough to notice. And he said to her, well, you know, I'm a married man, you know, I'm married. He said, but I don't wear your, so where is your ring? You are misleading me. You don't have a band, you don't have a ring. So once I see you without a ring, I take it to mean that you are single. So go wear your ring. <laughs> and of course, afterwards, he wore his ring. But that is just one isolated case. You don't have to wear red in the bands to even show that you are married. You have, a, you have a mouth, you have a tongue in your mouth to say, listen to me, don't pass your place with me. I'm a married man or I'm a married woman and so on. But I can understand why you think that it is sort of a double standard, uh, but the church doesn't prohibit the wearing of wedding bands. There are three hands up, Sister Sigri, and then we have Brother... But uh, Elder Gordon, Sister Sigri, Elder Gordon, there's another hand up here. <clears throat> uh, my question is first. Yes. We have the, when I got baptized, and the, it was 20 questions that you have to give an account. 20, for, Sister Sigri? Um, at the time when 20? I, 20, it was 20. We have to, I are 23. I somewhere in the 20s. Okay. Anyway, one, it was said, do you believe in mm -hmm. the writing of Ellen G. White? Yes. And it's still there. Was, yes. Now, what you are saying there now with the custom, mm -hmm. which of them is stronger? The word of the man that was not inspired or the word of the person that was inspired? Yes. Which of them should we stand by? I'm almost certain, and, and, and I'm going to look at it in Testimonies, Volume 3, that the servant of the Lord is also making that statement. Don't quote me. I'm going to look for it for you. Um, I'm going to look for you. Um, well, it, it is not the servant of the Lord. This is the church speaking now. In some countries and cultures, the custom of wearing the wedding ring is considered imperative as functional jewelry having become, in the minds of the people, a criterion of virtue, and hence it is not regarded as an ornament. Under such circumstances, we do not condemn the practice. That's what we, that's what we teach. Now, folks, it is not me saying it. I'm quoting what the church is saying. All right? And Sister Sigrid, yes? I'm coming to you. White 
Is it from Ellen White or the minister's name? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to research it because Wait. I need to. I cannot give you an answer now. I need to research it more in Testimonies Volume 3, um, her counsels on it. But it seems to be here. This is not from the quotation of um, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3. Uh, so I'm going to research it to you, Sister Sigrid. We have discussions to yeah, have. Yes, Pastor. And if yeah. it's not from the Ellen White's writing, yeah. I condemn it. You condemn it. <laughs> I heard Sister Sigrid. Sister Sigrid, she doesn't have everything, you know. She doesn't have everything, and light still continues to, 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 to be shared on the hearts of men. Um, Elder Gordon, and then we go to Sister Roberts. Yes. Oh, Sister Melville, yes. Okay, um, respect what you have said, Pastor, but... Not, not me have said it. Uh, uh, oh. I respect the position of my church. All right, respect the position of the church. Yes. The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes. But if they can permit that, they will permit other things that would not be mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to choose proper words so that I don't say what I and should And we say. are on the World Wide Web. So I am not comfortable. You're not comfortable? No. All right, so we have some I'm more talking to do. I'm not comfortable because other things can come into play where it's not biblical, but the, the church, mm -hmm. and I noticed you said the church. Mm -hmm. So it's like you tell a child, don't do this, but you do it. Okay. You know, so we need to really straighten up ourselves, especially now that we are, can be seen and heard from different angles. Amen. Amen. Sister Gordon, Elder Gordon rather, Elder Gordon. I am a little confused. Yes. Not really confused, if yes. you know what I mean. Um, I just want to make a point that the married ring yes. actually represents the disc of the sun, mm -hmm. which is linked to sun worship. Mm -hmm. But as you, said that, as you said, and I agree somewhat, is that it is functional jewelry. But there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. I was having a little conversation with my wife. Yes. Uh, and she's saying that anyone can decide what is functionary uh, jewelry. Mm -hmm. So there's a very thin line there. Mm -hmm. But we must be clear that the ring, the reign of the ring, comes from sun worship. We, we, we must know this. Which is not to say that we are worshiping the sun if we yeah. decide to, to don mm -hmm. the, the ring. I don't wear, wear the ring. And nobody troubles you. Well, no, no, but that's not the issue. <laughs> I, I, I understand the point you want to make, but that's the issue. Yes. But, but we must have the knowledge. We must be made aware. Yes. Um, um, pastor. Yes. That it comes from um, sun worship. But we are not saying that person should not wear the, the married ring. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little concerned, though, because I am a little late. I don't know if we have shifted a little from the true church and the false church. You could I, shed some light, Elder. I, no, because we are spending so much time on that which is known already. Mm -hmm. I am very interested to learn more about the true and false church when it comes to the wearing, uh, when it comes to the donning of jewelry. Mm -hmm. Because we know there's a connection. Mm -hmm. We know Satan was okay. made and so on, and the type of stones and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And Satan really is a... Is it, is it engineer mm -hmm. behind false worship and he was decked mm -hmm. in he jewelry. was decked as well in jewelry yeah. so uh, I am just I think we need to spend a little more time if we can get the true and false church right mm -hmm. I think it will be, it will be a bit I, it, it, I think it, it is there already we, will, we have read the scripture yes we have deliberated on it no and but, um, in the and notice notice as Elder is on that point all churches allow their members to wear it. May I make one final point, though? And Elder Gordon made a point, and that is the point I'm searching for in my head. The origins of the wedding band is not of God. It is not wholesome. And when I was trying to connect it, I just forget the quotation, but it was 
of great importance in early Christianity when uh, by about six, seven centuries and so on. That was a topic of discussion. And, but the Roman church really, and so on. So the, it's food for thought. We don't have all the time to, or to go through everything. But I will say we are more than armed with information and why we do not wear jewelry. You continue. Can I, you mentioned that a pastor went to some country. Yes. And he was approached by a woman. Yes. But you know, to be a married man no, and, to be, and to be wearing a, wing, a mm -hmm. ring, you're mm -hmm. a prime target for women. Mm. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. Because if the man is married, there is not much responsibility for, for me as a woman. Okay. So the ring doesn't make a difference. Okay. What makes a difference is a ring on the heart, the ring Excellent. of the heart, the commitment. Mm -hmm. This is what is important. The commitment to that woman or to that man. The, the ring is really insignificant yes. in the scheme of things. So the problem is a circumcision of the heart, Pastor. So the question about why spend, on, why spend too much time on that which we already know, we do not know it. We don't know it. We do not know it. In fact, as of last week, few people knew why the position of the church, why we take that stance on jewelry. This is something we know partially, but these are things we need to know that we can give response when it is asked to us. Why don't you wear jewelry? We can give authoritative answers as to this is why we do not wear. So it's something we need to put before the church and especially uh, members. More and more Christians, it is becoming, the wearing of jewelry is becoming normalized. And once things are normalized, what happens? It becomes the norm. And hence the reason why we are talking. Now, Shadika Roberts, there are four hands up. One, two, three, four. Now, folks, be brief. We just have 15 minutes. We just have 15 minutes left. I'm asking you to be brief with your comments. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um... A couple rule of thumb. The first rule of thumb is that God has his truth and then the enemy as the counterfeit, mm -hmm. right? Um, to Elder, God is point about the, the whole ring and what it symbolizes, right? We also have a position that the ring also symbolizes unity, but because they know that the world have um, perverted everything that is true and then then there's this school of thought that says, shun the very appearance of evil. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, some customs, which is some can be personal and some can be cultural. But um, I think our sister was trying to get there, but she never finished to get there. Does culture trumps doctrine or does doctrine trumps culture? You yes. understand? So we should be careful of that, you know, that our personal conviction as well as what the, the society says. Mm -hmm. We must examine, does it align with what the scripture says? Okay, thank you so much. And religion is sensitive to culture. But we believe as a church, where culture deviates from what the word of God says, we uphold what the word of God says. Uh, briefly, thank you. Yeah, there's a piece. Um, I think his testimony is to ministers. Yes. It says... Not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold. Speaking about the wedding band. Yes. To testify that we are married. But it goes on to say that in countries, and I think that's where the church's position may come that's from. It. it says in countries where the custom is imperative. Yes. Now, I don't know what that means. Imperative means you must wear it if you are married. Right. So only in countries where it's imperative, then it says... We have no burden to condemn those who have their marriage ring. Let them wear it if they can do so conscientiously. But not let our missionaries feel like the wearing of the ring will increase their influence one jot or tittle. Thank you. So you have, you have just read from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 366, 65, 66. And then the church gave its commentary on and it's coming from the manual as well. Thank you so much. And very much food for thought. Um, don't wear it. And I think Ellen White's stance on jewelry was so against it. 
she was very much against it. Um, one, two. Who was first, husband or wife? Wife, go first. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Yes. Um, could you shed light on the, is there, uh, there are similarities with regards to the ring that the, remember the, the, the parable with the particles son? Yes. When the father gave their son that ring yes. versus married. Yes. And that question came up last week on this end. One, there are certain times in scripture, scripture is detailing the custom of the day. Not that it is supporting the wearing of the signet ring. So in the parable given in the book of Luke, it's not a real story, no, it's a parable. And the story is given when a son in the culture, when a son is returning home, a signet ring symbolizing welcome, I accept you, is given. It is not a biblical concept. It is that which was practiced within the culture in which the Bible was written to. And of course, it is going to be reflected in the scripture. But this is a very important point because whenever the topic on jewelry comes up, that question comes up and so on. It is, was cultural in first century Christianity to do so. But it doesn't mean that we are asked or it is permitted that we wear it. Um, husband. Before, I, before he answers, yeah. I mean, says... Um, yeah. This question, are you saying that we should negate the fact that married ring is wrong? Should we accept that mar wearing married ring is wrong from, as a Christian? Because remember, you know, the pastors, when you're getting married, the same Adventist pastors are the ones who ask you, are there any rings? Yes. So why do, why do they pray over it and sanction it in a way so that it becomes, you know? Religious? Okay, I'm going to read again. It was read. This is the third time we're going to read it. And in some countries and cultures, the custom of wearing the wedding ring is considered imperative. And the imperative we see here is you are must, you are under obligation. And there are some cultures like that. Having become in the minds of the people a criterion for virtue, and hence it is not regarded as an ornament, under such circumstances, we do not condemn the practice. And I will tell you, when you read the writings, you will recognize we are not for wedding bands. However, it is permitted. It is permitted. And there are many of you all who think it's double standards. There are many of you all, but we can go on and on and discuss this. But where it is imperative, we do not consider it as ornament, but um, a criterion for virtue, and so on. And under such circumstances, we do not condemn it. I will tell you, sister, that the question of wedding ring has been normalized. So, because all of us wear it, all of us just wear it. It's just become something that you need to have. For example, sister, I would tell somebody, why do you, I said, if you're not, if you don't have all the funds to get married, why don't you give each other a watch or a bouquet of flower to exchange or without? No, me must have a ring. In fact, it is so ingrained in the culture that not to have a wedding band means you are not married. But that is what tradition has done to us. You know what I mean? But you don't need bands to be married. Tell me one out. Husband. Happy Sabbath. Everyone. Happy Sabbath. When I speak, I speak about facts, not opinion. Many can hold on an opinion, but I'm speaking on facts. I surely know that everyone inside here most of the members inside here drove a car. And you carry a license plate. Am I correct? 
Mm-hmm. You can't carry a license yes, plate. Yes, man, it carry license plate. Okay. I don't take out this unless I am angling bleach. Mm-hmm. That's the only time I take out my bag. Yeah. No, the the light, the marriage ring that on the person and represent license plate and mm-hmm. the vehicle. If somebody stole a car, <laughs> there is no way you can find it. Yes. So look at it that way. Okay. Uh, uh, very <laughs> thought-provoking point. The ring is a license. And, and by the way, within the culture, that is what it is. And, and don't laugh. That is why our church is saying, you know what, in cultures and countries, we permit it. But is that really what the Bible and spirit of prophecy teach? Of course, in days of old, that was practice. Jewelry was given in a form of a dory in ancient Mesopotamian, just as in Indian time with the Indian culture, Eastern culture with the dory, it is given. But when we look at the entire corpus of Scripture, from Genesis down to Revelation, we are seeing here the seam, the, the message that is here, that we are receiving here, that jewelry, as part of attire, jewelry should not be worn. Now we are going to, I'm getting the, the time signal. The young people in our church have this question many times. And I don't think we try to indulge them enough or explain to them enough and to give them sufficient information that they can be armed to answer the question if they are asked. And I will tell you, not only in Jamaica, but across the globe, the youth have this question. Now, this is one question being asked by a young person, very intelligently put. It says, my question has to do with the wearing of jewelry by Adventists and the baptizing of new members who wear jewelry. Isn't it isn't fundamental belief number 22, Christian behavior, very clear about onward adornment? And in our church manual, it seems very clear that the wedding ring or the wearing of jewelry is not in keeping with our faith. Why is this being allowed by leadership and not being addressed? If in fact, this is still one of the fundamental teachings, not only of our church, but even greater of the Bible. Josh from the United States, and um, hear the response given. Josh, you are right. that The topic of adornment is addressed both in our fundamental beliefs and in the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual. Um, I don't have time to read everything. So the person said, yes, the practice continues. Uh, But he goes on to say, this means that our amusement and entertainment, quoting from what the manual says, and let us remember that it is not outward adornment that expresses true Christian character, but the hidden person of the heart. When the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And, and, and so it, it really falls back on our principle of attire. Simple. And I will tell you something. Joshua's teacher, um, my friend from Cedar Grove, lady in green. The... Adventist has a simple philosophy. When you read through our writings, it says Adventist funerals and weddings should be characterized by simplicity. Are you with me? We should dress, and one of the features of our dressing is simplicity. Our homes, simple. The idea of simplicity is really ingrained in Scripture. And Adventists are characterized or should be characterized by simplicity. 
and especially for the issue of attire, how we dress. This is of most importance to God, how we dress, our attire. And although attire doesn't mean that you are a Christian, there are some well, simple dressed demons and devils. Yes, they don't even believe in God. But we are saying the Christian and attire, it should be simple. A question was asked last week Can you imagine Jesus decked out in jewelry? Dog, me have bummy ears there, you know. And you are laughed. Can you imagine Jesus decked out in those things? I know not. You cannot imagine him dressed like this. And this is a question of great importance as we race towards eternity. The question of attire is going to be a temptation for you, Sister Roberts. And I want not for you to yield to temptation, but stand as a brave, as a face to the foe. Make your apparent, your apparel, and your attire be characterized by simplicity and modesty. What is wholesome? God is expecting that of our sister Kadisha, and this is our last comment. You know, as you talk about oh, simplicity, simplicity of dress, and how oh, Christians are character, characterized by modesty, right? Um, God, in His wisdom, in, if you look in Leviticus when He was telling them how to dress, yes. and that you know the, the the hidden nations have this practice of mixing the fabric and elaborate and stuff, but today we know we call that. Um, the polyester, the synthetic, and we realize it is not good. They tell us now, the, the scientists are telling us about the core body temperature and what synthetic fabric and mixing the fabric does. So you see, God in his wisdom, you know, and um, the jewelry that the children of Israel got from, from, from Egypt, yes. when, they were to, when they were told to, you know, to, to take the jewelry and stuff, it wasn't for idol worship, it was for their, to build their trade and commerce. You understand? Based on my understanding of the Bible. It was used for idol worship as well. Yeah, but I'm saying it wasn't for that, but they used it. Okay. Because they used the knowledge. All right. They, they, Miriam, they received, they, they knew how to, to do the goal and melt the goal. But what they call it, they said male and female, mm -hmm. because they know which metal to melt and stuff. But today we have the periodic table. Mm -hmm. And they teach us about metal and non-metal on the periodic table, right? So they, they did not talk know that it is not mm -hmm. metal and metal but they knew it was they knew how um which metal to can mix to combine and to combine like the iron and the nickel and the gold and stuff and you understand why miriam and Hiram were able to tell them how to do the thing so you see god in his wisdom give them wisdom for them to be better but they corrupted it for their purpose so everything that you read that god you see that god in his wisdom is just guiding us you understand? Everything that he does is just wonderful. It's just beautiful. If we just follow God's principle, he never steers us wrong. Amen. That's Sister Kadesha, you are so intelligent. Keep on reading. Folks, let us stand as we pray and transition to AY. Father, we are grateful for your love towards us. You have created a simple, yet so magnificent. As we spoke about the issue of jewelry and attire, and the standard of Christian modesty, and as we surveyed from Scripture the matter of jewelry, I pray that your children will be rooted and grounded in the Word of God, not in tradition, not in culture, but in the word of God. I pray, O oh Lord, that those who are here, especially the youth among us, will be thoroughly armed. When they are asked about their faith, they can give reasonable and biblical answers. Continue to nurture us throughout our Bible class and continue, O oh Lord, to teach us as we apply to our lives. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.
Okay. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Okay. I just want to welcome to you, welcome you to another AY program. Um, if you enjoyed the day's program today, say amen. Say amen. Okay. Okay, so I promise you today that this program will be spirit-filled, and it will be. Many renowned names will be performing once again, only songs, and I hope that you'll be blessed and you just minister to someone throughout this week. And please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this program. Thank you for this, this day, dear Father. Thank you for allowing us to bring souls to your kingdom. Please just protect us and cover us as we're going through the following week, dear Father. And please just cover the singers as I pray, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Can we please stand for the AY emblems? The aim, the Advent message to all the world in my generation. The motto, for the love of Christ compels me. The pledge, loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the youth ministry of the church doing what I can to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. The song, Adventist youth are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a fair to share. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. No, man. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We'll be moving into our song service. And we'll be starting with the song, What a Mighty God We Serve. Oh, 
Good afternoon, church. Okay, so um, the song we, we will be doing is uh, reminding us that, you know, sometimes we have sinned and we have fallen short of God's glory. But the best thing that we can ever do as Christians is to ask for His forgiveness. And He is willing and able to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we sing this song, I hope you'll be blessed by the message of the song. Don't mind our defects, but let us minister to you as you will be blessed by the Father. Yeah. 
Take my hand and let me stand where no one stands alone. Are you here to worship Jesus this evening? Oh, well, you don't sound too sure, so let me ask it again. Are you here to lift up the name of Jesus this evening? Amen. We have come to worship Jesus. So this song, it comes from Psalm 100 that speaks to making a joyful noise and entering into his gates with thanksgiving. Wilton. Just something about that name. About that name. Master. Master. Savior. Savior. Jesus. Jesus. Like a fragrance. Like a fragrance. After the rain oh jesus jesus my jesus let all heaven and earth There's just something, there's just something about that name. Praise the Lord. Show joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Come worship Him. Before the throne of God, for the Lord, He is good, and His love endures forever. So we enter. So we enter 
praise and offerings of thanksgiving. So we enter in to bless His name, lifting holy hands in honor of our King. Omnipotent, amazing, our God will reign forever, magnificent, breathtaking, our God will reign forever, omnipotent, amazing, our God will reign forever, magnificent, breathtaking. Earlier in song service, one of our favorite choruses was done. It says, what a mighty God we serve. Do you believe that you serve a mighty God? Does everybody understand or does everybody know just what God means to them? Do you know who God is to you? So let's talk about God this evening. Let's talk about what he means to us and who he is in this world. The God of the universe loves me and he knows me by name. I'm overwhelmed that the voice of creation speaks to my heart just the same. He tells the wind when to breathe and be still. He calms my heart when nothing else will. The God that I serve is the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and all who believes. He is the Lamb and the Light of Jerusalem, Bethlehem's Holy One, Messiah, my King. Master and Ruler of Heaven and Earth, that's the God I serve. broken, a lamb for the lost lonely soul. He suffered the weight of our sin on Mount Calvary. By His stripes we are made whole. We are made whole. Why should I worry when trouble is near? He's my deliverer. And all who believe, He is the Lamb and the Light of Jerusalem, Bethlehem's Holy One, Messiah, my King, Master and Ruler of Heaven and Earth. That's the God I serve. My 
redeemed, my helper, my savior who died, redeemer, deliverer, he is alive. The God that I serve is the God of Abraham, Jacob and Isaac and all who believe. He is the Lamb and the Light of Jerusalem, Bethlehem. Holy One, Messiah, my King, Master and Ruler of Heaven and Earth. That's the God I serve. I serve. I serve the God I serve. And we leave you with this last song because we've just spoken about the God that we serve. We are so thankful for his spilt blood that gives us the opportunity of having the gift of eternal life. Amen. And we say, thank God for it was a great thing that he did for us. The Lord has brought me through all my troubles And when I failed Him, He didn't cast me away He stood right by me through all of my troubles When I was lost, He didn't let me go astray he took my sin and saved my soul. He cleaned me up and made me whole. Jesus died on Calvary so the whole wide world could see. It was a great thing that He did for me. It was a great thing that he did for me. It was a great thing when he set me free. Jesus died on Calvary so the whole wide world could see. It was a great thing that he did for me. It was a great thing that He did for me. It was a great thing that He did for me. It was a great thing when He set me free. Jesus died on Calvary so the whole wide world could see. It was a great thing that it did for me. Oh, it was a great thing that it did for me. It was a great thing when he set me free. Jesus died on Calvary so the whole wide world could see. It was a great thing that it did for me. Jesus.
was a great thing. Amen. Good evening, everybody. This has been my first time singing here. So I would like a bit of a better evening. Good evening, everybody. All right, so um, the question was asked, do we know what God means to us? But do we know what we mean to God? So much that he sent his one and only son to die for us. The song that they just sang said that it was a great thing that he did for us. So the first song that I'll be doing will speak about the love that God has for us. Fresh. 
precious blood covers me and I'm so glad his precious blood covers me it is finished the battle it is finished there'll be no more war it is finished the end of the conflict it is finished and Jesus second song it really means a lot to me because um, last year I moved to Montego Bay well I moved up two years before and last year I got married there and one of my well the toughest year that I've ever had was that year um, it led to me having to leave a well like a job that I really loved and had a lot of perks and it paid very well but spiritually I was literally drowning and one of the things that I'm oftentimes encouraged because you know a lot of times we we do find ourselves in some situations where all, all we can do is pray and I just want to encourage you this afternoon despite whatever you are going through despite whatever situation that you are facing just pray on. The army of Judah was paralyzed by fear when they heard the mighty multitude was quickly drawing near but as they prayed for deliverance the victory would begin for when we call upon the Lord we summon all of heaven to pray on for Hold down, stay on your knees, for this is where the battle is won. Very soon you'll win the victory. Pray on. You see, when Daniel faced the lions for worshiping the Lord, it seems that was no hope at all for what would be in store but 
when we stand on holy ground our smallest prayer is heard for when we call upon the Lord we summon all of heaven let's pray on for you are who the Lord is looking for pray on for the heroes mighty strongholds that may seem in vain they don't seem to make a difference they don't seem to make a change just rest assured God knows your needs and he hears each time you pray your prayers are reaching heaven and the answers are on the way just pray on for Turn 
though mine eyes they can see what is waiting there and though my mind it can conceive all that God has prepared and then the blind will see the sun what was old will be young and the lame the lame will run all over the streets of that city on that day we will sing holy holy on that Good evening, church, or good afternoon, or it's evening, technically. Good evening, church. Good evening. Uh, so this song I'll be singing reminds me that on this earth, uh, we seem to have heavyweight champions like Muhammad Ali or, or the most fearful in the box ring, uh, Mike Tyson. But I'm reminded that there's a, a great champion a great head boxing weight champion, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the champion of love. So I hope you are blessed as I sing this song.
raise his hands in victory for you and for me. And in the crowd cried, Crucify the King who wore the crown. As they gladly watch the champion go down. Oh, I'm there for counting out for I'm the witness of. Oh, the day he rose to reclaim the title. Champion of love. He is higher than the highest. Greater than the great. No one could ever take his crown away. So he is more mighty than the mightiest. He reigns from above. Understanding that everything will get better all by and by.
Happy Sabbath Mandeville. Happy Sabbath Mandeville. So you want me to ask you again. Happy Sabbath Mandeville. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you once more and to be a part of this warm church family. So we have two items in song for you this afternoon. And we really do hope that they bless each and every one of your hearts. Many times I've questioned certain circumstances or things I don't understand. Many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision and my frustration gets so out of hand. But it's then I am reminded. I've never been forsaken And I've never had to stand one test alone And it's through all the victories His Spirit rises up in me And it's through the fire My weakness is made strong Oh, He never promised that the cross would not get heavy on the hills wide. Just remember where you're standing in the valley of decision. And the adversary says, Give in, just hold on. Oh, Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire. Again. I know within myself that I will surely perish Oh, but if I trust the mighty hand of God He'll shield the flames again, again He never promised that the cross would not be heavy or the hills would not be hard to climb He never offered my victories without fighting But he said the would always come in time Just remember where we're standing In the valley of decision And the adversary says just hold on Our Lord will show up And He will take you through the fires again So just hold on Our Lord will show up And He will take you through the fires again about God delivering us through our fires. Have you ever, you know, been in certain situations, you know, you just feel like the devil, the devil, I try and I try hard, I try hard. I just feel like you're in a storm. I feel like a hurricane, Sandy, hurricane, Gilbert, every single hurricane we can imagine. Right? You feel like that's where you are. But then at some point in time, you just decide to, I'm going to calm my nerves. I'm going to take it to the Lord. Yeah. And I'm going to allow him to just put me in the eye of the storm to rest. Yes. Because why should I worry? Why should I fear? When I can just calm down. Yeah. 
Yeah? Yeah, man. God, he's, he knows everything that it is that we go through. And he knows when we need. He knows especially when we need to calm down. So the next song that we'll be singing is Eye of the Storm. And we'd love if you all could sing with us. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Amen. I shall surely rest in the eye of the storm. We serve a very awesome God. And it's good for us to be reminded how great our God is, not just in the good times, but also in time of grief. Also in, in our sorrows, God is still a faithful God. If you have felt the dark of night Questioning what is out of sight He is the answer, He is the light And if you have felt the weight of sin Bound by the shame that hemmed you in He broke the chains he will forgive Lift your head Morning is coming, there's more to the story Don't forget In grief or in glory, still great is His faithfulness You felt broken or betrayed No one to trust, alone, afraid He'll comfort you, He knows your name If you've wrestled with the ache of loss And why this has been your road to walk He bore your pain Cross. Lift your head Morning is coming, there's more to the story Don't forget In grief or in glory, still great is His faithfulness He's so is present helper keeper great is his faithfulness perfect sovereign fortress great is his faithfulness Abba Father comfort great is his faithfulness Wait on him, rest in him, come find 
Good evening. I'm sure we all can say we have spent a blessed time in the house of the Lord from morning until now. Certainly, we have been blessed. I have been blessed. And I'm looking forward for another time like this. God is good, my brothers and sisters. So we have to sing praises and thanks to him because of his goodness. To close this wonderful day, I invite you, we've been sitting for quite a while, uh, we'll stand and sing first verse of the song, Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. Pastor, come and lead out in this one for me. And then I'll just speak to you short while concerning the recipe to overcome evil. Come, Pastor. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. 474. you to turn with me to James 1, James 4, and we'll read alternately verse 1 to 10. I'll start. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Verse 2, congregation. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Your 
Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Last verse. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The recipe to overcome evil. And three points. You got to submit to God. At all times, you got to stay close to God. As, as I shared with a good friend of mine past week, I said, in spite of the challenges you may have, hold on to the mighty hand of God. If you submit to God, challenges will come. But I can assure you that God will see you through those challenges. Next thing you got to draw an eye to God. Draw an eye. Stay with him all the time. As I have said, the moment you decide to take a chance going down the wrong road, that's the time when the devil said to trip you up. But guess what? Like David, keep holding on to the mighty hand of God. David didn't leave God. No matter what he faces, he always go, keep coming, keep coming, going back to God. And the third, humility, says, humble yourself in the sight of God and he shall lift you up. I could give you stories. It's good to be humble. And I am, well, I'm telling you, if you are not humble, you can't make it into the kingdom of heaven. God loves a humble spirit on a contrite heart. And if you ask him, he will give you the grace to be humble. So I'm just exhorting you all as you face this untried week. Hold on to the mighty hand of God and keep humble. He will lift you up. There's no end to where you can reach when you submit to God. There's no obstacle you can't overcome when you submit to God. So I charge you, submit to God. And he will take care of you. As we face this untried week, hold on to those three points that I gave you. And may they be your guide as you face this upcoming week. We'll close, continue with take the name of Jesus with you. We start it. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how he thrills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ. Stand it. Musician, oh the precious name of Jesus.
just thankful for the blessings of today. Certainly a blessed Sabbath day. Lord, as we face this untried week, we are asking Thee for Thy divine protection to fly the traps and the snares of the enemy that is there. And as what James admonished us to hold on to Jesus, draw nigh to Him, and the devil will flee from us. So be with every worshiper as we leave the courts this evening. And Lord, we look forward for that blessed day when we will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. We look forward for that day when Jesus will put in his appearing and we all will go home to live with him eternally. Bless us again, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, everyone.